Coming up on Space Time, the mysterious moons of Uranus, the magic key to getting satellite navigation to work, and early problems for Europe's JUICE mission on its way to the Jovian system. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers reanalyzing data from NASA's Voyager spacecraft and then comparing to new computer modeling say that four of Uranus's largest moons may contain liquid water oceans under their icy crusts. If confirmed, it adds to a growing list of objects in the outer solar system now thought to be ocean worlds. The findings, reported in the Journal of Geophysical Research Planets, provides the first detailed study of the evolution of the interior makeup and structure of all five of Uranus's large moons, Ariel, Umbriel, Titania, Oberon and Miranda. The work suggests that four of these moons hold oceans that could be dozens of kilometres deep. Scientists know of 27 moons currently orbiting the ice giant wall of Uranus, with the four largest ranging from Titania, which is 1,580 kilometres wide, to Ariel, which is 1,160 kilometres across. Scientists have long thought that Titania, given its size, would be the most likely to retain internal heat caused by radioactive decay. The other moons had all previously been considered too small to retain enough heat to keep an internal ocean from freezing. That's especially important because heating provided by the gravitational pull of Uranus would only be a minor source of heat. Astronomers who have listed Uranus for priority exploration have now begun focusing their attention on the planet in preparation for a potential mission. The study's lead author, Julie castillo Rogues from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, says the new work could inform how a future mission might investigate the moons, but it also has implications that go far beyond Uranus. She says that when it comes to small bodies in our solar system, that is dwarf planets and moons, planetary scientists had previously found evidence of oceans in several unlikely places, including the dwarf planets Ceres and Pluto, as well as Saturn's small moon Mimas. This paper investigates what those could be and how they're relevant to the many bodies in the solar system that could be rich in water but have limited internal heat. So the authors revisited findings from NASA's Voyager 2 flybys of Uranus back in the 1980s and from ground-based observations. They then developed computer models and infused them with additional findings from NASA's Galileo, Cassini, Dawn and New Horizons missions, each of which discovered ocean worlds, including special insights into the chemistry and geology of Saturn's ice moon Enceladus, as well as Pluto and its moon Charon and the dwarf planet Ceres all icy bodies around the same size as the Uranian, and yes, that's how you say it, moons. The authors use that modelling to gauge how porous the Uranian moon's surfaces are, finding that they're all likely to be insulated enough to retain enough internal heat needed to host an ocean. And they also found what could be a potential heat source in the moon's rocky mantles, which release hot liquid and could help an ocean maintain a warm environment, a scenario that's especially likely for Titania and Oberon, where the oceans may even be warm enough to potentially support habitability. By investigating the composition of the oceans, scientists can learn about materials that might be found on the moon's icy surfaces as well, depending on whether or not material underneath is pushed up from below by geological activity. There's evidence from telescopes that at least one Uranus moon, Ariel, has material that flowed onto its surface relatively recently, possibly from an icy cryovolcano. In fact, Miranda, the innermost fifth-largest moon, also hosts surface features that appear to be of recent origin, suggesting that it too may have held enough heat to maintain an ocean at some point. But the thermal modelling also found that Miranda is unlikely to have hosted water for long. It loses heat far too quickly and is therefore probably frozen solid. But internal heat wouldn't be the only factor contributing to a moon's subsurface ocean. A key finding in the study suggests that chlorides as well as ammonia are likely to be abundant in the oceans of the icy giant's largest moons. Ammonia has long been known as an antifreeze, and the modelling suggests that salts also likely present in the water would be another form of antifreeze, thereby maintaining the body's internal oceans. 
Digging into what lies beneath and on the surface of these moons will help scientists and engineers choose the best science instruments to survey them. For instance, determining that ammonia and chlorides may be present means spectrometers which detect compounds by their reflective light would need to use a wavelength range that covers both these compounds. Likewise, they can use that knowledge to design instruments that can probe the deep interior for liquids. Searching for electrical currents that contribute to the Moon's magnetic field is generally considered the best way to find a deep ocean. That's how Galileo mission scientists confirmed Jupiter's ice moon Europa also harbours the global subsurface ocean. However, the cold water of the interior moons, such as Ariel and Umbriel, could make the oceans less able to carry these electrical currents and would therefore present a new kind of challenge for scientists working to try and figure out what lies beneath. This is space time. Still to come, the magic key to getting satellite navigation to work and early problems for Europe's JUICE mission, which is on its way to the Jovian system. All that and more still to come on Space Time. When you think about it, satellite navigation systems such as GPS have totally revolutionised how humans get around, providing us with precise three-dimensional positioning down to under a metre. It lets you know exactly where you are, which way you're going, and how fast you're moving. And it all comes down to a series of very accurate high-performance atomic clocks fitted both on the ground and in every single navigation satellite. And right now, the most accurate for civilian use are those fitted aboard the European Space Agency's Galileo Satellite Navigation System. The atomic clocks on the Galileo satellites deliver pinpoint timekeeping maintained to a few billionths of a second thanks to the ultra-rapid and ultra-stable oscillation of atoms between different energy states. But sustaining this sort of performance level demands even more accurate clocks down on the ground in order to keep the satellite synchronized and to ensure stability of time and positioning. The European Space Agency's Technical Centre in the Netherlands is charged with the job of monitoring the Galileo system time independently of the satellite operator. It's a task accomplished thanks to an ensemble of high-performance atomic clocks which are kept in thermally stabilised clean room conditions at ESA's UTC lab. The collection of refrigerator-sized atomic clocks provides stable timing, typically accurate to a billionth of a second. That's almost 10 times better than the Galileo system time. In fact, the UTC lab, together with similar clocks in the Navigation Support Office in Germany, are used to set a common timescale, which in turn is one of the inputs for setting Coordinated Universal Time, or UTC, what we call Greenwich Mean Time. Now, exact positioning requires precise timekeeping. That's because Galileo works by determining the distance from a satellite to a receiver on the ground, or in an aircraft, or on a boat, using signals travelling at the speed of light. By measuring the exact time taken for the signal to cover the distance from the satellite to the aircraft, ground or boat, and then adjusting for orbital speed, the Earth's rotation, atmospheric anomalies, gravity and other known variables, an exact location can be determined. Galileo's satellites operate in three planes at an altitude of 23,222 kilometres above the Earth, transmitting signals downwards that incorporate a timestamp. A sat-nav receiver on the ground picks up four or more of those Galileo signals in order to pinpoint its position. By the time the signals reach the receiver from the satellite, it's taken about a twelfth of a second. The receiver then multiplies this difference by the speed of light, about 30 centimetres per nanosecond or a billionth of a second, in order to derive the exact distance from each of the satellites in orbit. It then combines these measurements in a triangulation to compute its overall position. Now, if one of the clocks is in error by more than, say, 3 nanoseconds, this positioning value will be off by more than a metre. To prevent this happening, eight satellites equipped with twin hydrogen maser atomic clocks. These measure time to an accuracy of one second in three billion years. There are also two smaller rubidium atomic clocks on each satellite as well. They act like independent and alternative time sources and are accurate to within three seconds in a billion years. 
Still, despite all this accuracy, the atomic clocks aboard the satellites are prone to drift slightly over time. So a worldwide network of Galileo ground stations keeps a continuous tab on the satellite signals to identify any clock drift compared to Galileo's system time. Any errors are then corrected with an updated navigation message every 100 minutes or less. This report from ESA TV. Europe's Galileo constellation is the most precise satellite navigation system in the world, delivering meter scale accuracy. Its signals let us find our way on foot, by car, even in boats and aircraft. So how do Galileo satellites, thousands of kilometers away, tell you exactly where you are? Simply being so far away is part of the answer. The satellites fly in three orbital planes. 23,222 kilometers above Earth's surface. Anywhere on our planet, at least four satellites are visible at any time, the minimum needed for positioning. Each satellite emits a radio wave containing its transmission time and the satellite's own position. Because radio travels at light speed, the signal's distance of travel is measured from the difference between the signal time code and the time the receiver picked it up. It's like working out how far you are from a thunderstorm by counting the seconds between a lightning flash and its slower thunder crack. Time is converted into distance. For useful positioning, this timing must be accurate to a few billionths of a second the time it takes for light to travel 30 centimetres. Combine distance measurements from multiple satellites simultaneously and your position is pinpointed. A minimum of four satellites is needed, three to fix the user's latitude, longitude and altitude, and a fourth to double-check time. Your receiver is smart, it knows the expected locations of the satellites to cut signal acquisition time from minutes to a few seconds. And as Galileo signals are very faint, equivalent to a 60 watt light bulb shone down from space, they are based on complex codes identifying each separate satellite. The receiver has copies of all these codes so can make its own full-scale replicas of faint original signals for calculation purposes. These are used to calculate your final navigational fix, boosting our economy and quality of life by letting everyone, everywhere, find our way. This is Space Time. Still to come, early problems for the European Space Agency's JUICE mission to Jupiter. And later in the science report, a major advance in slowing down the progression of Alzheimer's. All that and more still to come on Space Time. A key radar antenna aboard the European Space Agency's JUICE spacecraft has failed to open as planned. Mission managers say the critical 16-metre radar for Icy Moon's exploration antenna has only unfolded about a third of the way and appears to be jammed. The antenna is needed to appear beneath the icy crust of the three Jovian moons being targeted by the mission, Ganymede, Callisto and Europa, which are all suspected of harbouring vast subsurface liquid water oceans under their icy crusts. Engineers suspect a tiny pin may be protruding, and flight controllers in Germany plan to fire the spacecraft's engines in hopes of shaking the pin loose. If that doesn't work, they'll have lots of time to try and figure something else out. 
That's because JUICE, the Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer spacecraft, won't reach the Jovian system until 2031. The $1.8 billion mission launched aboard an Ariane 5 rocket from the European Space Agency's Kourou spaceport in French Guiana back on April 12th. The 6,070-kilogram bus-sized spacecraft will undertake a series of gravity-assist flybys of the Earth and Moon, as well as Venus, in order to slingshot itself to its distant deep space targets. Mission managers say all other systems aboard the spacecraft are operating nominally, with the radio dish, solar panels and 10.6-metre magnetic field probe all deploying successfully. This is Space Time. And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with the Science Report. In what's being described as a major step in slowing down the progression of Alzheimer's, drug company Eli Lilly have announced the results of their Phase 3 trials, which have shown a 35% reduction in Alzheimer's progression. The company claims its drug Donanumab significantly slowed cognitive and functional decline in people with early symptomatic Alzheimer's disease. The trial looked at how the drug altered a measure of cognition and ability to partake in activities of daily living. It found that for people with early stages of Alzheimer's, there was a 35% slowing of decline on the scale. Meanwhile, a report in the journal Neuron has unveiled another potential new drug to help treat Alzheimer's. Phase 3 trials showed that the drug lecanemab slowed cognitive decline in patients with early Alzheimer's by binding with and neutralizing amyloid beta plaque protein bundles associated with Alzheimer's disease progression. Scientists have discovered a potential antidote for the poisonous death cap mushroom. The fatal fungus is responsible for more than 90% of all mushroom-related deaths worldwide. The main toxin produced by death cat mushrooms is called alpha-amanitin, and the researchers identified a key protein, STT3B, which is required for alpha-amanitin to have its toxic effect. Once they identified the protein, the authors then looked for drugs that might block it, and they found one called idocyanin green, which is already approved by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. However, a report in the journal Nature Communications says more work still needs to be done to assess its safety, but when they tested the drug on human cells exposed to the toxin, it acted as an antidote, blocking the toxic effects. A report in the British Medical Journal says medical doctors and public health experts are joining calls to suspend development of artificial intelligence until sufficient regulations are in place. The researchers cite three major reasons why artificial intelligence currently poses a real risk to public health and safety. The first being its ability to ramp up surveillance capacity on the public, which can be used to manipulate consumer choices, spread misinformation and social division, and even enable government oppression. The second reason is current and potential future development of military weapons that can kill entirely without human supervision. In other words, it's the Skynet Terminator scenario. And the third is the loss of jobs that will come as artificial intelligence allows the automation of more and more different types of work. Last week, Jeffrey Hinton, the man widely seen as the father of artificial intelligence, quit his job with Google, warning about the growing dangers of developments in artificial intelligence. Hinton's views echo those expressed earlier this year in a public letter by Elon Musk, Steve Wozniak and more than a thousand other tech leaders calling for a six-month moratorium on all development work on artificial intelligence because of concerns over its use. Google have just relaunched their new Smarter Bed Artificial Intelligence Chat GPT. They're hoping the updates and changes they've made will help people forget about the disastrous first take when the AI chatbot provided the wrong answer, in the process tanking the company's stocks by 8%. However, it didn't take long for Bed to show its faults, displaying some strong and politically biased views. As well as the new software, Google's also launched new phones and tablets. 
with the details, we're joined by technology editor Alex Saharov-Royd from Tech Advice Start Life. They've got AI everywhere in all of its announcements. They've got a new generative AI experimental section for regular Google search. So you have to go to g.co forward slash labs. And then you can get a generative AI response to your queries. You can actually see a whole bunch of things for sale that relate to that if that's something you want to purchase where Google can actually update those for sale links 1.8 billion times per hour. It's very fresh data. And it can also show you not only where the information from its generative AI response came from, but also it will prompt you on other questions you can ask. And it will remember what it told you before and it will remember the context. So search is going to change, but there's a stack of other things there. Google Bard is now no longer on a wait list. It's opened up to 180 countries. Just go to bard.google.com. If you have a Gmail account, you can start using it straight away. If you have a workspace account, you need to get the admin to switch that facility on, but it's there as well. They also have these large language model engines behind the whole thing. There's a new thing called Palm 2, and they've got four different versions of that. The smallest of which can fit onto a phone. And so it's a bit like Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, a book that has everything you know in it, all the answers you possibly want without having to be online. I can see that sort of thing becoming very popular very quickly. And they have much larger language models that are to be used by companies who want their own private things or just by people who want a chat GPT clone for their own uses without having to go online. So for all these highlights and more, come to my site, techadvice.life, L-I-F-E. I've got a link to the full two-hour keynote there's also another organization's 18-minute cut-down version and another version from Google. Lots of information and details and links to all of their official Google information there. Very exciting stuff. And as well as the software, there's some new hardware out as well. Yeah, Google has become very strong in hardware. They've got their Pixel line of phones, very successful. I mean, clearly lots of competition out there, but they've got the new Pixel 7a, which is their lower-cost device, 499 in the US, 749 in Australia. There are cheaper phones out there, but this has Google's most advanced Tensor G2 chip. It's got a 90 hertz screen, so quite smooth scrolling, 8 gig of RAM. It gets Gets the Google updates immediately upon being launched. You don't have to wait months and months like you do with other brands. Three years of Android updates, five years of security updates, and of course all of Google's photo smarts. And they even have an app called uh, the Voice Recorder that not, not only records live audio but gives you a live transcript as well, which is very handy. Uh, only Google offers that natively. Then there's the Google Tablet, uh, four ninety nine again in the US, eight ninety nine in Australia. Eleven inch tablet comes with a speaker magnetic stand, so that it's it's like a smart display, smart home speaker when you're not using it as a tablet. But you can just clip it off; it's magnetically attached, and bang, it's a tablet in your hand. And so it's got really you know dual uses there. It's always going to be charged when you need it, always ready to go. And finally, the Google Pixel Fold. It's like the Samsung Galaxy Z Fold, except it's from Google. It's got a larger, wider front screen. The Samsung's one is quite narrow, and internally, it's got a nice square kind of unfolding internal screen. You can still see the crease, unfortunately, but that's modern technology and its limitations. No stylus support, however. If you want that, you still need Samsung. And it's $1,799 US, which is at least 2700 Australian. So they haven't launched it in Australia, probably because it's quite expensive. There seems to be a huge discrepancy there between what a US citizen and an Australian citizen are paying for the same product. Certainly doesn't seem to reflect the exchange rate. When you look at the tablet, your 400 X dollars for the US and 800 next dollars for Australia. Yeah, I mean, that there they're putting 150 bucks on. Yeah, that's... for sure. So Australians do pay more. So, yeah. That's Alex Sahara of Royd from Tech Advice. Life. That's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favorite podcast download provider, and from spacetimewithstuartgary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Spacetime store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Spacetime patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. 
And if you want more space time, please check out our blog, where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Spacetime YouTube channel, and on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. And Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 